Ah, this is uh, this is bizarre. This I is Peter am Vice Tolan. President Mike Pence. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Tolan is the uh, man who co-created and directed literally half of the episodes of Rescue Me. Um, yeah. with me. Shit, yeah. uh, his other work includes, so he's got he's got Emmys. I don't, but he does. Uh, because he worked with Gary Shandling on Larry Sanders show. Uh, and before that, uh, uh, Murphy Brown, which is where he sort of cut his teeth in television. <laughs> and uh, some of the funniest movies of the, uh, the past fucking couple of decades, including one of my favorites, Analyze This, which is a fucking hilarious movie. Yeah, yeah sure, sure. It's my way of saying that he is, um, and also a great fucking actor. If you, we did a show oh, together. Boy. No. That is really not true. Okay. <laughs> I can prove that it's true because you can fucking watch it, okay? Uh, first of all, we did a show called The Job together at ABC, which was a sitcom, which was yeah. really a good show, Great and we show. had a good show. Great show. And thank God they canceled it after two seasons because then if they hadn't, we wouldn't have done Rescue Me. Correct. But on that show, he fucking acted in that show, and he was fantastic, and he also played one of the guest chiefs on um, Rescue Me. That's and he's, right. He's That's a really right. good actor, and he won't fucking admit it. And, and I want to just say one other thing, that I'm really fucking glad that the right. Dan Rather crowd winced when they heard the title of my fucking book. <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck you, Dan Rather. <laughs> I've never said that in public, but uh, now I have. <laughs> but, but in person, all privately, all the time, oh, yeah. Fuck you, Dan Fuck Rather. Fuck you, Dan Rather. Yeah, yeah. I spent so many years saying it privately, it feels so good to get it out in the open. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Am I supposed to introduce you because... Uh, no, you don't have to introduce me. No, because I'll just say he's a cunt. Yes. So anyway... And by the way, when you read the book... That covers that. There, yes, oh, there, I know. There's I a suction that. in... Uh, suction. There's a there's suction su in the book <laughs> yeah, uh, sure about the is. word cunt. It's in there. And uh, it, it is based on my upbringing. I was raised by two Irish people. And the word cunt in, in the Irish um, tradition does not mean, uh, uh, when you go to Ireland, don't say fanny, because that's cunt in Ireland. In Ireland, cunt is everything. Cunting car, the cunting weather, that cunt was down the pub last night. But don't say fanny, because that means cunt. Anyways, <laughs> the reason I mention this is because we did an episode of Rescue Me uh, oh, God. That, that was called Cunf, C-U-N-F. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, and it was about uh, my wife and my ex-wife at the time and my mistress came to the firehouse at the same time for the first time in the history of the, show. of the show. And we got a call and had to leave and they got stuck at the kitchen table <laughs> and they decided to text each other um, insults. And Stephen Pasquale, a brilliant actor who played the dope Sean Garrity, yeah. walked in because he, he, was, he was injured, he was on reserve duty and he walked in and was like, hey, what's going on girls? And then looked over at one of the phones and went, what's a conf? And that was like the theme of the episode. And the reason that we did it was because we thought it was funny, but it drove the Fox censors crazy because this woman at Fox was convinced. John Langreff said you can do it because nobody says cunt. They just say cunt. cunt. And this woman spent months reading the script and saying you can't, I know you're going to say it, I know you're going to say it, didn't trust me or him. Then we shot the episode. She was yeah. convinced she heard a T. Yeah, there's a T in there. To the point where, when it was absolutely okay and it aired, she still called Langreff and went, I know somebody said cunt. And I can't prove it, but I know it's in there somewhere. These are the kind of things that make me and Peter proud. Yeah. It's a, it's a really long, uh, a long uh, career uh, with some uh, distinguished stuff, and it really just comes down to cunts. Yeah, it does. That's what it, it does. It really does. Well, I think it's wonderful that you're in LA, and it certainly it has something to do with your esteem uh, that they actually started a wildfire so that you'd have something to breathe in between cigarettes. Uh, <laughs> that's nice, don't you think? <laughs> I knew you'd fucking bust my balls about that. And this Somehow. is really our relationship. Our relationship is me busting his balls. So please don't think I'm being mean, we're just talking. Yes. It's really just how we communicate. Peter, when, I, when Peter and I first met, um, I was a huge fan of Larry Sanders, obviously, and, um, and I loved that show. And, uh, and so when I, somebody said, I was uh, thinking about doing television, and somebody said, Peter Tolan, who did Larry Sanders, is available. And I was like, Jesus Christ, Peter Tolan. And I can't remember who was the person that mentioned it. It said, you know, he's from Massachusetts. And I was like, how the fuck do I not know this guy? So we sat down and met 
within the first five minutes, he was shitting on me, I was shitting on him, and I'm like, all right, he's from Situate. He's an Irish Catholic, uh, low-rent Irish Catholic That's person right. from Situate. I'm a very, I'm a very low-rent motherfucker <laughs> Irish guy from Worcester, Mass. So we hit it off like this, and uh, yeah. and that's how the job happened, and that's why. But you remember, we could have met many, many years earlier. Yes. In 1976, I graduated from high school, and I only got accepted two places. One was UMass Amherst, and the other was uh, Emerson. Yep. So we would have gone to school together, and we've decided we would have hated each other, and there would be no rescue me and no job and anything like that. Oh, yeah, and at least one of us would be dead, yeah, I exactly. think. Yeah, yeah, probably me. But, um, <laughs> I don't think yeah, so. and also, uh, you, you know, you were doing a, first of all, as you mentioned, UMass Amherst, I mean, fucking mice can get into that school. Oh. I mean, <laughs> and at that time, it cost like a dollar and 50 cents to go for a year. It I mean, did. that's, yeah. Well, that's uh, why but, I went. That, so he went there, and um, <laughs> and he met and worked with this guy named Kenny Ober. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Kenny Ober, years later, who's a, uh, another guy from Massachusetts, becomes the host of Remote Control on MTV, and at Remote Control, with Colin Quinn as his co-host, Colin Quinn brought in me, and Adam Sandler, and Ben Stiller. I brought in John Tenike and Mike Armstrong, who were two writers from uh, the Emerson Comedy Workshop. So that think that was like 1988 at MTV. Yeah. Uh -huh. That was our cast. The, it was the stars were Kenny and, and uh, Colin Quinn, and then the guys who did like recurring characters were me, Colin, Ben Stiller, and fucking Adam Sandler. Yeah. And that's how we all. That's really the beginning of it all. Was was right there. And whatever happened to him? Who? Sandler. <laughs> I don't know. He's around. I think he's around. By the way, he actually does a great job. If you've seen this movie, The Meyerowitz Story, haven't seen it. It's he's really good at it. He's got the, he's got the ability to be a really good actor if he just fucking did sh stuff like that. I thought we should just take at least one moment during this evening to talk about a really good actor. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! I, I want you to remind me yes. how how you ended up at Emerson. Okay. Because did you? When you were in Catholic school, yeah. did you do theater at all? No, I no. did, I did. I ended up doing theater. So okay. this is what happened. Uh, uh, so I, my, I have my, my older brother and I shared a room the entire time when we were growing up, and he, he was three years ahead of me. So my brother got into high school first, obviously, and what I saw of high school, first of all, I wasn't the greatest student to begin with, and uh, it was all of our, all the American cousins my parents are from Ireland, all the American cousins, we all lived in the same neighborhood. There was like fucking 20 something of us. We all went to this neighborhood school. So the older ones that they hated, like my brother, they, they, you didn't have a chance because by the time you went to the next grade, they're like, oh great, another Leary, you know? <laughs> so the nuns hated me to begin with and I just kind of fed off that. And as I got older and started to doubt many of the things they were saying, I, I began to, to behave like my brother. I looked at my brother, they would give my brother books and he would just throw them away. And I'm like, oh, you just throw the books away. That's awesome. You don't have to read them or do the homework. And then he got into high school and he started playing football. He was a football player. And, uh, and basically what he was doing was just like getting high and drunk and playing football. And I'm like, I can't wait to get to high school because I wanted to play hockey. Right. I wanted to be a hockey player. So once I got into high school, I was just like, yeah, you just throw the books away. <laughs> this is what I'm telling my friends. You don't have to read those books, just throw them away. So I flunk off the, uh, the hockey team my freshman year, you had to have a C minus average. One of the teachers is the hockey coach, and I got a fucking three Ds and two Fs. And they, yeah, so I, got, I flunked off the team. And I'm like, ah, oh, this sucks. Now there was an old nun, Sister Agnes Catherine. She, they didn't know, they didn't have, call it Alzheimer's then. She was just fucking batshit crazy. <laughs> she, was like, she was like 97. And early in the class, you raise your hand, you go, sister, 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 I have to go to the boys' room. She lets you out, you just disappear for an hour and go downstairs she and has, smoke. She has no memory. No memory, right? Yeah, so I, w I would just, I would fuck, I was the first guy to raise the hand and go out of that class, <laughs> go down to the men's room and just fucking smoke for an hour, right? So I'm, I do that and I'm heading to the men's room to smoke and Sister Rosemary Sullivan, who's the theater nun, grabs me. Larry, come here. Uh, I, want you to, I want you to be in this musical I'm doing. And I'm like, what? She's like, you get out of it. The last period of school you get out of, I'm having these rehearsals downstairs. So I'm like, all right, I'm in because I get to skip another class. And Bill Murray told the story like this in his Catholic school. This is literally what happened. I'm walking down the hallway at like two o'clock, 
towards this room she told me to go to. And I can hear this music playing. The musical was, I think it was Bye Bye Birdie. Okay. And she's, I can hear her yelling at guys, grab her by the bosom, underneath the bosom, and the rump, and lift her up. And I'm going, what the fuck? And as I turn around, and I, I can see into the room now, it's all the hottest chicks yeah. from high school in the room, and these guys holding them by the ass, like in dance moves. And I'm like, OK, this is pretty fucking cool right here. <laughs> So I did that play, and... Uh, now, and did you have a part, or were you in the chorus, or what did you... I remember, you know, we did it twice. We did Bye Bye Birdie twice. So I think, I think the first time, I didn't play Birdie, I think I played the Dick Van Dyke part. I, you know, we never talked, I played that in high no, school. No, we did talk about that. Yeah. You're just, now you have Alzheimer's. <laughs> but that's how it started. So okay. I, I, I uh, then I went and got some hockey players and a couple of uh, uh, other athletes, and I was like, guys, you get to grab the best looking girls in school. I started dating this chick, Mary St. Thomas. She was the female lead. She was hot and smart. So I was in. And, and then that nun, Sister Rosemary Sullivan, had studied at Emerson College. Oh. And so when, as we were coming towards senior year, and I was like, you know, really not, I had no other talent except holding pretty girls up and, and singing, uh, yeah. and, uh, screaming, singing uh, at that point. She, but I was funny. Um, she said, uh, I can get you an audition at Emerson College. And they have scholarships because my parents couldn't afford, you know. This is a test uh, that's, that's of the emergency. It's OK. All right, good. good. I think there's an Amber Wait, Alert, Is that apparently. somebody's phone? It's an emergency thing. Okay. Yeah. All okay. right. <laughs> Ooh. I think if you are in this LA Talks event, please leave now. It's, <laughs> it's about to go very bad. Yeah. So anyway, I just wanted, I just had never knew the connection. Yeah, so I, that's, I, got, a, I, got, a full, I got a full scholarship, and it saved, okay. changed my life. Uh, and what is, the, what is the, and I've never asked you this question before, what is the least Dennis Leary-like show or part that you ever played when you were at Emerson? Oh my God. Uh, I fucking, let me tell you something. <laughs> it's happening. It's every time I talk. That's I think, weird, Peter. I, yeah. <laughs> What's going on, Pete? I think a bullshit detector has been uh, installed. <laughs> I think some oh, fresh. Oh fuck, you got one of those. <laughs> God damn it. I think some fresh batteries oh, have been boy, put in. Boy, this is fucking payback time now. By the way, if it is anything about North Korea, do let us know. Yeah. Just so maybe we can get to the car. I don't know if that's going to help, but whatever. <laughs> what was the least Dennis Leary-like thing you did in college? Um, you mean on stage? Yeah, please let it be embarrassing, too. That would oh, be good. God. I didn't, you know, I was at, by the time I got to freshman year, you had to do uh, two musicals freshman year at Emerson. And I was over the fucking musicals by the time I got out of high school. So I did Damn Yankees. Which, uh, which part did you do? The, one of the fucking, you know, chorus of baseball oh, okay, players. Now, okay. this isn't embarrassing for me, but it was, listen, <laughs> this kid, I can't remember his name. He was, a, uh, he was one of the gayest men I've ever met in my life, and that includes some, some very gay friends of mine, okay? okay right. And he was a terrific dancer and singer, but he's playing a fucking baseball player. And he's, he can't play a baseball player. He was the lead. So I remember being in the chorus of the other guys, just going like, how the fuck is this guy playing a fucking, because he was a senior and he had to have a leading role. Yeah, sure. And that's when I was like, I'm fucking out of the musical theater thing, completely. You were and, just upset about the unfairness of the casting. Yes, and that's when I started uh, with Mario Cantone and uh, Lauren Dombrowski yeah. and uh, uh, some other talented people, this uh, Emerson Comedy Workshop. We, we got funding from the student government and credit to put on our own shows for like the next, the, the last three and a half years that and, I was and there. And when you did that, as a, you know, because I remember doing sort of the same thing at UMass, where with a full cast of mice, by the way, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, Very musical mice. I would dress them up, and they, they didn't dance much, because they were dead. But anyway, <laughs> did you, uh, at, at what point, did you ever like have an, did you ever aspire to be successful in the arts? Oh, fuck At yeah. That no. age. Oh, yeah, no, 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 no. No, I knew once I got the first few laughs in those musicals, I was like, all right, so I'm funny. And my dad was funny, my mom was were funny. So I knew that. When I got to school uh, and I was going through that fucking uh, the musicals that freshman year, um, 
I, I started, was running into very talented people. Stephen Wright, the comedian, who was not a performer yet, he was just a writer. Um, Lauren Dombrowski, who was a terrific actress. Mario Cantone, who was a fucking force of nature. Yeah. We were all bitching about the same thing. Like, yeah. But when I saw Mario and Lauren, those were two of the people I was like, I knew Stephen was talented as a writer, but there were people that were, Gina Gershon, people that were so fucking good there, you went like, wow. I'm in the same I'm in the same shows with these people, and I'm holding my own. And uh, so, in my I was studying acting and writing, so my safety net was supposed to be the writing. Yeah. Um, and thank God I took it. But um, as we got older and went through the you know uh, sophomore, junior, and senior year, and we started to do these these plays and these shows. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I was I was aware of. I thought Mario was a guaranteed star. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, Lauren was a great writer. She ended up being one of the producers and writers on Mad TV for fucking ages. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and you know we had people that Norman Lear had gone there, Carol Burnett. Um, uh, I'm forgetting a couple of the people that were writing on Saturday Night Live, which was the original cast. That's when, this was like the in the yeah. late '70s, and they came to the school to do these like these talks like this. <laughs> and one of them, uh, Marilyn Suzanne Miller, who's one of the yeah. original writers of Saturday Night Live, came right. to see one of our shows, and afterwards she was like. You guys are fucking great. You're great. You're great. She was like pointing people out and giving us notes. And at that point, you're like, okay, that I can't tell you how big. Do you think SNL is big now? That fucking original cast, man, that was like a fucking rock star. There was nothing on TV like that. So to have her come and tell us that we needed to move to New York and LA when we graduated, and that we all had something to offer, that that was like the seal of approval. Speaking of SNL, did you ever like want to do it? What do you mean, as a host? No, as, a, as a, when you were younger, as a cast member. I would have done it if I was younger, if I'd gotten the opportunity as a cast member, but I, I've always turned down the hosting because really? it's a fucking shitload of work. Yeah, I know. I mean, you know, I've had so many friends on that show for years you know, as writers and cast members. Like, why on my week off when I'm pushing the book or a movie or Rescue Me, do I want to go and fucking work 24-hour days and read off fucking cue cards because I can't memorize the fucking lines? So I, I, You know, I auditioned for it. Did you know that? No. Yeah. Many years ago, the year that Al Franken and Tom Davis were the, were the producers of it, I auditioned. Did they grope you? They, it's, exactly. <laughs> did, it, did Al Franken well, grab? And you liked it. I blushed, but yeah. okay. <laughs> I was younger. I didn't know that. I mean, I didn't know that you'd been groped by Al Franken, but also I didn't know that you'd auditioned for him. Well, I, I, I did SNL. audition, and it was not good. Because first of all, I used to do this thing on stage, which was a Reader's Digest condensed version of the movie The Wizard of Oz. Oh, and I, by the way, I've seen video of it from when he was in high school, and it was it's college. Yeah, yeah. Was anyway, it college? I thought it was high school. No, no, okay. college. And was, I would do the whole movie. And yeah, everything. and it was pretty fucking funny. Yes. So yeah, all was, the voices and everything. That's what I was doing for my SNL audition. And it's one. Of, it's like a, a movie. It could be a movie where you're waiting and you're listening to the person in the room go in the room before you, and he's doing The Wizard of Oz. I swear to God. Oh my God. He's doing The Wizard of Oz, and I'm just like, what the fuck? Then I go in, and Al Franken is eating lunch while I audition. And I, I remember it was like a chicken salad sandwich, and like stuff's <laughs> falling out of it, and I'm, all I can see is the stuff, and I'm like, someday, motherfucker, I'm gonna get you. And I did. And you did. And I did. And you did. Yeah, I waited until he got in the Senate, and yeah. boom! Yeah. <laughs> so you got all these women to come out. And, oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Hey, yeah. payback's a bitch. Oh, I know. Don't eat during my audition, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Al, Al Frank is like, why did these women come out of the woodwork now? Peter fucking told an asshole. <laughs> Could have fucked not eating that sandwich during his audition. And now you're paying for it, mister. I hope you're happy. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know what character that is. I have a, you know, I'm, I'm, it's my mom. I think that's my mom. Speaking of your mother, yes. who's still still living. Yeah, my mother. Is, mother is my mother's nine, nine years old, nine. and and uh, remembers. Not By only does way, she remember everything I did wrong, but she remembers <laughs> the exact dates and who I was with, what we did, and the emotions that she felt when she found out. So while she tells the story, she's like, that day in 1972 when you and your brother and your cousin Jerry, blah blah blah, and she gets angrier and angrier. Like, ma, relax. I can't remember this shit. So she's just like a guilt-fueled Mary Lou Henner. Yeah. She could just... She's <laughs> Mary Lou Henner. Wow. Mary right. Lou Henner has that thing where she can remember everything that's ever happened. I'm sorry if I have to explain the references, you motherfuckers. Jesus. I knew Mary Lou Henner. I didn't know that she had she this... She has that thing. Okay, what is she it called? It's a, is it... 
What? Say again. Identic memory. Identic memory. She has it. That's what my mom has? <laughs> she, she How has do you get rid of that? <laughs> is there a medicine? No? Can you tell us? I want you just to tell a story. I think this is, I, I always get confused because I've worked with Dennis so long and Lenny Clark. Lenny is also mentioned in the book as well. Um, but this, I think, is a story about your dad and the piano. No, that's Lenny's dad. Oh. That's Lenny's dad. Yeah. Lenny, so Lenny, uh, Lenny comes from a family of eight kids that grew up in the Irish projects in the shadow of Harvard. And, uh, and uh, his, his dad was a typesetter at the Boston Herald. You know, like in the old days when you went in and fucking actually set the letters up that are going to fucking print the stories that these reporters wrote. It's yeah. a tough job. And, but he would come home for dinner every single night. And there's like eight kids living in like two bedrooms in this fucking project apartment. And somebody in the family, I can't remember who it is, so I'll just make up, one of the sisters wants to learn how to play the piano. And another kid in the family says, I'll learn how to play it too, Dad. So this fucking guy, who's barely you know, scraping yeah. by with these eight kids, goes out and buys one of those I, you know, the stand-up pianos. Like a spinet. Yeah, a spinet piano like in the kitchen. You know, They barely have room. And I guess this was over the course of a couple of years. The girls had taken some lessons. They weren't that good. Then they lost interest, right? So whatever this particular night was that set him up, he would come every, home every night for dinner at 6 with the family, and then he would go back to work. Yeah. And he came home, and uh, I, I guess Lenny was coming back to the table, and he bumped his elbow on the, on the piano. And no, he caught his... Oh, yeah, yes. Of his pants. Yeah, caught the, his father caught his, the pocket of it. He had the typesetter of pants where you put the hammer in these little... Um, yeah, and he caught one of them, and it ripped, and he fucking snapped. And he had a hammer with him from work, and he went, has anybody learned how to play this fucking piano yet? And <laughs> Lenny tells the story. They were all like, oh, my God. And so before they can answer, he goes, not what he is, not what he is. Fuck you and fuck this piano. And he fucking smashes it into a million pieces, into a million fucking pieces. And they go, I'll see you tomorrow, and walks out the door. And they're all just like, wow, dad's pretty angry, huh? <laughs> Holy shit. But he really just yeah, smashed it. Smashed so it to smithereens. A piano. Those were the days. Oh, God. Yeah. Those were the fucking days, man. Oh, Jesus. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> and we survived. Yeah, I know. And here we are. So how did you, how did you just to keep uh, this evening rolling? Yes. How did you end up doing stand-up? Okay. Easy story. Huge fan. George Carlin, when we're like... I think I was probably 12 or something like that. We hate the nuns. We think the nuns are bullshit. <laughs> we, we're starting to... I'm already kicked out of the altar boys for drinking the holy wine, which was a fucking... I tell you what, it was the best thing I ever did. So I was saying that... I was saying... Of, yeah, no, it's an after... <laughs> it's, it's a true story. Okay. John Strelevich, Polish kid that I went to school with, right? We're, we're backstage. We used to call it the backstage behind the fuck. And we're already, like I said, we're already like, we're sick of the fucking whole thing. The good thing about being an altar boy is if you got to do a wedding or a funeral mass, you got, the whole Catholic church is corrupt, obviously, you know that. You get 50 <laughs> bucks in cash. 50 bucks in cash in the fucking, whatever year that was, 1970, whatever. It's not a lot of fucking money. So you put up with having to do the regular masses. This one priest, Father Donnie, he was late one day. So the other priest, I can't remember his name, Father Carmody, he comes in, he goes, Father Donnie is late. Uh, the four o'clock's going to start a little late. I'm just taking out the holy wine for him. He takes it out and he leaves. So we're just sitting there shooting the shit. And I'm like, dude, that's the fucking holy wine. <laughs> You know, the whole Catholic Church is built on the magic thing, you know, oh, the body and the blood and all this. You, we had to ring the bells, and it's, if you've never been to a Catholic Mass, like, our job is to ring the bells and do all this magic stuff while Jesus is transforming. <laughs> yeah. I've always hated magicians. I've fucking hated magicians, right? So, so I go, dude, there's the fucking holy wine. It's like, there's a, some of it's in the chalice, but there's a big bottle of it, and he's, and he's just like me. He's like, dude. And I'm like, we got to try this fucking holy wine. <laughs> Right. We, the original idea was one sip each, and just to see if we like could do magic. So we go over, <laughs> take take a couple of hits, and then we're waiting. Fucking Father Dunny who's not there, so we're like, like one more hit. Chikang, chikang. <laughs> Nothing's happening. We're like, fuck, dude. Maybe you got to drink a lot. Chikang, chikang. <laughs> fuck you. By the time Father Dunny shows up, we are fucking shit faced, right? <laughs> but like we're at the early stage where we can hold it together, right? Yeah. So out we go to do the mass. Now you, you know you have to kneel across. He's in the on the altar facing the audience. You're like doing all this fucking holy shit. And we, we're kneeling, facing each other, and I have to ring the bells, and he's got to fucking deliver the fucking the host and all that bullshit. So, but we're fucking finding the whole thing funny because we're shit faced. Yeah, of course. So I ring the bells at the wrong time, and Father Dunny gives me a dirty look, and now I'm like, fuck, dude, this is hilarious. <laughs> 
I just start ringing the bells like every other day. It was fucking awesome. It was fucking awesome, dude. He was so rip shit. Afterwards, we go backstage. He goes, you're excommunicated. You two are drunk. And I go, I, the one thing I knew about the Catholic Church, I go, you can't fucking excommunicate me. Only the fucking Pope, Pope. can excommunicate me. Come on, John. So now me and Slovich are walking home. It's like six blocks, right? Like a moron. Now it <laughs> dawns on me. Shit, he's going to call our parents. By the time we get back, to, by the time I get to the apartment, I'm fucking dead, which I was. But the great thing was they said um, that we could, Monsignor Sullivan said that I could, uh, the, my father had to pay a, uh, a fine. And my father's like, I'm not paying a fine. He's like, then he has to be in the choir boys. So I, was, oh. I, I swear to God, this is true. I was in the choir boys for one week. And I did not light this cigarette. This cigarette was handed to me <laughs> by Alfred Castle, who was sitting, I was on the aisle. Yeah. It was at the high mass, the 12 o'clock mass on Sunday. And you know, you're up in the choir balcony, which is the good thing about being in the fucking choir. Yeah. And I was just minding my own business and I got tapped and there's a fucking cigarette. And the choir director is facing you know, the, the stage where yeah. the mass is. Yeah. So I just was about to take a hit and he turned around and I got caught, which is, was fucking great, because then it was out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was out out. <laughs> And right, I, go, I, I want to say like a week later, Class Clown by George Carlin came out. Right. And that's, my, my brother and I were like, hey, this really is fucking bullshit. Because George Carlin, half that album, it's all about the seven dirty words for mm -hmm. most people. But it's, there's a lot of anti-Catholic church stuff on there. Like, this guy's fucking great. And fuck these people. We're going to stay in this fucking prison that we're in and just fucking taunt them like crazy <laughs> until we get out. And it was fucking great. Sister Judith Capman. The Spanish nun, I, I'll never forget her. She, she had these buck teeth. And uh, she, I, I never fucking read the book. So, I mean, I can't do math. Fucking never mind, learn another fucking language. What are you, nuts? <laughs> so I flunk junior year and then senior year. I'm just fucking flunking it, right? So she gives a test like, you know, halfway through. She's like, you know, are you studying this? I'm like, no. And she's like, I'm going to pass you just to get you out of this building. <laughs> and I'm like, go ahead. She's going, you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. And I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> so funny story. One other kid in my neighborhood that went to that school, Michael McGraw, became a Broadway musical oh, theater yeah, guy. Yeah. Yeah. And he start, finally got his big break in Spamalot, which is hilarious because we used to fucking you know, recite Monty Python bits when we yeah. were kids. He was cast in Spamalot and won the Tony. And one night while he was doing that show, he was done meeting and greeting people. He's taking his makeup off, and some PA came up and went, hey, there's two old nuns coming up the stairs <laughs> that said they want to talk to you. He's like, two old nuns? And he looks down, he sees these two old nuns, and he sees the fucking buck teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Judith Kaepernick comes in, talks about how great the show was and how proud they are of him, blah, blah, 45 minutes. Mike's loving it. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I'm still friendly with Mike. And at the end, she goes, whatever happened to that Dennis Leary kid? <laughs> and he goes, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Just so she could go to her grave thinking, I got that one thing, yeah, yeah. you know? <laughs> I showed him. So it was Carlin that got you started on Carlin that. and Richard Pryor. Once, yeah. once, uh, because that was like, uh, pa people's parents were buying those records. My parents didn't, but in the neighborhood. And uh, once I discovered, you know, this is Pryor and Carlin. We had seen them on the Ed Sullivan Show when they were clean cut. Yeah. And then they took like two years off and they grew their hair and they fucking changed their acts. Yeah. Those two guys became my guide. Yeah. And well, that was, what was the question? I totally no, forgot. No, 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 I just asked how you started doing stand-up. All right, okay, right, so. Uh, I know, I'm, I'm fucking getting the Alzheimer's. You are getting yeah. the Alzheimer's, that's um, right. When we graduated, yeah. Mario Cantone and Lauren Dabrowski were doing a double act. They wanted to find a place to do like a, a, a stand-up double act. Yeah. So they come, we're all working like fucking side jobs. There's no acting jobs in Boston. And they come back one day. Lauren was working in a, as a waitress uh, in this restaurant where Paula Poundstone was the, the bus girl in her shift. Paula fucking Poundstone. Okay. So they come back from, her, Mario and Paula come back one night and they go, we went to this fucking Chinese restaurant in Cambridge, Massachusetts called the Ding Ho. And Lenny Clark is hosting a fucking talent show. And fucking Stephen Wright gets introduced because we went to college with him. He was the shyest guy in the world. Couldn't talk to anybody. Stephen walks up on stage and faces the back wall and recites the, you know, those jokes that he does. And, and the people think that's part of his act. And he kills because the jokes are brilliant. But I'm going, you got to fucking be shitting me, Stephen Wright. 
So I go, like a couple nights later, and I asked Steven, he's like, yeah, I do it, I face the wall, and I'm also like Lenny, I'm like, Lenny, what the fuck? So I go, <laughs> it was such a weird show, there was like a folk singer, and there was a guy named Mr. My Way, and his act was, it was a tiny little Chinese restaurant. This guy got up on stage with two midgets, and he go, my name is Mr. My Way, and one midget would bite this elbow, the other one would bite this elbow, and he'd lift him in the air, and hold him up there for as long as he could. And the crowd would cheer. That was it. That was it. Jesus. So when I saw Stephen Wright, I was like, this is crazy. I mean, if he's getting if up he on stage, it, yeah. if he can do it. And then I, with Lenny, I was like, if Lenny can do it, I can do it. And then Lauren and Mario started going up and doing a double act. And that's when it really kicked in for me, because I was like, all right, I'm going to try this. And, uh, and Lenny, thank God, was like, just keep coming back, keep coming back. And then Lauren and, and Mario actually got pretty big for a while mm -hmm. as a team. And then they got into a huge fight and broke up. Mario moved to New York. When so. did you... <clears throat> I mean, I'm My sure. nose is running like crazy. What is it? It's the cocaine that you gave me before the show. Oh. You said it was good. It's not that good. Those were actually some bath salts that I gave you. Fucking asshole. Yeah, I'm sorry. Anyways, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, but you know, uh, when you were. I know you're starting out and everything. Your act probably sucked. I mean, I've seen it, it recently. It's still sort of like, mm, no. but, uh, It did. It sucked. It sucked. Thank but God. you stuck with it. But it wasn't until you were stuck overseas that you really wrote something of... Well, because some, I came from the theater, length. I was like, once I started doing stand-up, I was like, all right, so this is fine. But it was... Uh, um, you know, it was fucking rough because it was a, you're working in a bar. So even when you get good, there's people getting their fucking checks for their drinks and blah blah mm -hmm. blah. Um, and, and in Boston, you know, there's fucking fights every two seconds. Yeah. Um, and, and, and by the way, it was it was great. I mean, uh, Lenny's brother Mike ran that fucking Chinese restaurant stand-up comedy club. So I was working the door as well as being a stand-up act. So you could make like you know, in the course of a week, a hundred extra bucks cash. Um, and I was painting apartments and shit. Um, and so it was all right. Uh, I liked it, but. Because I came from Emerson, um, two graduates, Spalding Gray yeah. was a graduate of Emerson, and he would come back to the Black Box Theater and do his fucking one-man shows before he would take it to uh, New York. Right. And I saw one of those shows, and I was like, what the fuck is this? I hadn't thought of this. Because he was definitely, had the fourth wall was gone yeah. with him, right? And then Eric Bogosian came, because he was from Everett, Mass., right. and he did one of his shows, and I'm like, hey, wait. And that was when Mario flipped. Mario was like, what, wait, I can just do my characters like in a... Yeah. So, Mario started coming up with a one-man show that he was going to do in a theater. So as soon as I started doing stand-up, the whole time I was doing it, I was like, I'm eventually going to go back to the theater. I just got to, I would make notes about it, I'd write it down, and then eventually that's how, uh, you know, everybody was telling me, what are you fucking, all my friends that were stand-up comedians, including Lenny, were like, what the fuck do you go to a theater for? I'm like, because you can do a fucking show without people bumping into each other and getting right. into fights and fucking ordering drinks. So that's how that came about. And how is the writing? I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting into your writing career here. Right. As obviously, if anybody has the book, as limited as it is. <laughs> but I mean. It's shaped like a book. It's shaped like a book. Exactly. I like to call it, what's it called? It's called uh, why, why We Don't Suck, or I call it, I'll Never Get That Hour and a Half Back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hail. That is some, that's some wild stuff. Uh, but in terms of the writing of no, what became No Cure for Cancer. Right? Yes. Was that like daunting for you or did you, was it a no. long process in no. terms what, of- No, what was it? Yeah, it was a long process, but what I did was, uh, you know, so my father had died when I was young. My father dropped dead at age 60 in the middle of laughing at a joke that one of his brothers was telling him in a pub in Ireland. Yeah, it was pretty <laughs> uh, mortal blow to the family. Um, and my son was born in 1990 and uh, was three months premature. He was very, at that time, you can imagine, it, you know, uh, the odds were against him. And, and uh, they, they told my wife that she was going to have to be in the hospital for a while before she had him. And after he was born, that he was going to have to stay in the hospital for at least three months. So I was stuck overseas uh, in London. Um, and there were three guys who weren't famous at the time, Eddie Izzard, who was now famous, yeah, yeah. Uh, a guy named David Badil, another guy named Frank Skinner. They were stand-up comics that I had done this, this television show I went over to do. Yeah. Um, uh, and Eddie and uh, Frank and David were already becoming big guys on the scene, and they were like, listen, if you're going to be stuck here 
and I had been talking to them about doing this one-man show. They were like, you want to go to the Edinburgh Festival. It's going to happen at the end of the summer. You're trapped here anyways. We can, Eddie was key. He's like, we can set you up in art centers, like, like little theaters around the country, you know, not that far from London, so we could drive out, and you could do like 20-minute chunks of this thing and get it ready before you go to Edinburgh. And that's what saved me. Because I was like, what do you mean? And Dave and Frank and Eddie were like, the, you don't have to do stand-up at these places. So Eddie was already working on his version of it, of uh, uh, what he was going to turn into a one-man show, and so was Dave, and so was Frank. So that saved me, because I could go do 20-minute chunks. You know, I would do 20, Dave would do 20, Eddie would do 20, or Frank maybe, um, in a theatrical setting about not much bigger than this, really. Some of them were smaller, mm -hmm. but it wasn't stand-up. And so I did that the entire time my wife and, and son were in the hospital that summer. And then when they got out, um, because I had no fucking money. We had no money. We didn't have a credit card. We had nothing. Yeah. So uh, I got stand-up gigs through there, uh, Eddie and Frank and Dave's where, manager. Where did you stay if you were stuck? Oh, man, this fucking... When Ann was in the hospital, I stayed... This is so fucking weird, because I don't really... I didn't believe in ghosts until this time. My dad went to London during World War II and worked in a prison where they kept um, uh, Nazi POWs, guys who got shot down while they were trying to bomb um, uh, England. And my father said he was treated better by the, the Nazi POWs than he was by the British. <laughs> and I always remembered that. Yeah. Uh, and he tried to, to work there, but he wanted to come to America after the war was over. So I'm, I, got a, I could only afford this fucking tiny little room. It had one light bulb. It was, a little, it was big enough for uh, you know, like a little uh, cot. And uh, I forget, it was really cheap. But it was, right, it was a block away from where my wife was in the hospital. So I stayed there. And it was this weird fucking thing. There was a street light that never worked there. And, uh, and, and every time I, I don't want to talk about this too much because I'll, I'll get a little emotional about it, but I would go to the hospital every night and he was, he was not doing well. And then one night I was walking, they said, if he doesn't start to put on some weight, we're going to be in dangerous territory. And I was walking home and I was walking by that light and the fucking light went on. And I thought, wow, that was fucking weird. It just, for some reason I got a weird feeling. So I go, to bed, I get up in the morning, go to the hospital. He gained like some crazy amount of weight overnight. So I call the states, collect to tell my mom, yeah. and, and I tell her the thing about the light. She goes, what fucking street are you on? I tell her the name of the street. She goes, that's the street that your father lived on when he was in England. Oh, Jesus. And I go, you got to fucking be kidding me. And from that moment on in our family, every time some big event happens, there's a weird thing with, where lights go off or come on or lights that were yeah, dead that yeah. never, yeah. You, so, should, you should tell everyone the end of that story. Your son is how old now? My son is, oh my God, it's like a miracle. He, uh, he made it through and he, um, he's six foot six, he's 225 pounds, uh, healthy as a horse. It's one of those old wives tales. They yeah. say premature kids, if babies, if they make it through, their immune systems are so fucking strong from that fight. He's never been sick really a day in his life. He had a little bit of asthma when he was small. Uh, and uh, so but it's. I, but I've known ending. him so long, I knew him in his life. Yeah. Now he's 6'6. Six, six, so yeah. Like so it was. I mean, but I, I talked about that in No Cure for Cancer. All that stuff as it was happening, I put in because I was talking about uh, death. Everybody talks when they think about No Cure for Cancer, they think about all the smoking and the rock star stuff. But the second half of that show is all about death and mortality and about my dad dying, about my son almost dying. Yeah. Um, but I, I never forgot Eddie and, and uh, Dave and Frank. Dave and Frank became huge stars doing a show together in England, yeah. and Eddie became Eddie, and it was just so weird, these four guys, like, we, none of us had money. You know, we were just, like, making money from these stand-up gigs. But I didn't know that it was, they were so instrumental. Yeah, they in saved terms me. Of sort of guiding you they, towards They, they fucking saved me. They, first of all, they got me gigs that I could get some cash yeah. to survive on that summer, but also, I never would have been, I never would have done the show that summer without them, and I, the spot at Edinburgh that I got was because of those guys, and then I, that, that, that made No Cure for Cancer and my career start. When so you, you're, it's weird, dude. Whenever I see yeah. Eddie, it's like, yeah. it's like we're just back in, you know, in those days. We just start, you know, he's thinking of running for office, by the way. Is that right? Yeah, he's thinking of running for parliament. Mm. Yeah. Great. It's crazy. When you're, you're talking about your dad, you know, we, a lot of the time that we work together, you would tell stories about your family. And I just want you to tell about that you had an uncle, probably, who worked for the road oh, or the God. public works. Now, was that here or in Ireland? That was here. That was here. Yeah. Okay. So it's in Worcester. It's in Worcester. Okay. Do you want me to tell that story? Please do. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I had an uncle. Uh, he wasn't the only member of the family who drank. 
Um, let's, <laughs> let's start That's the, the preface. Story. Let's start That's with that the story. That's preface, yeah. But he, even as a small child, we, my parents, you know, my parents had uh, brogues, and, and uh, some of them were heavier than others. But, and they, you know, they occasionally, they, could, they would say prayers in Gaelic and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But my Uncle Connie was an extraordinary guy because um, most of the other adults we noticed growing up, they, drank, they began to drink at a certain time, which was after work, like from 5 o'clock on. Um, Uncle Connie just seemed to somehow just always be drunk or have a major speech problem. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's the way, that's all, that's what you would pick up. So as you get to a certain age, they tell you, listen, your uncle has a kind of a drinking problem. So <laughs> that's what's going that's on. You're like, oh, OK. So, uh, but it was a kind of a family secret. You never really got out to the public. We, we, we tended to him. We drove him home. We drove him here and there. And he finally gets a job for the street department, right? And, uh, and I, fucking, I pick up the newspaper one day, the Boston fucking Globe. Yeah. And there's a picture. It says, uh, a drunken Irish street worker trapped beneath pipe. And I'm like. <laughs> What the? And there's a picture of my uncle he in, trapped under a pipe in this big hole in one of the major avenues in Boston, just trapped like this. And he's holding a bottle of Jameson <laughs> that they lowered down on a rope to him. When they, when they were like, we have to bring in the fire department. Do you want anything? A bottle of Jameson. And they rolled it down to him. But it wasn't that the picture of yeah, the lowering the, fucking, the bottle Yeah, down it's like, unfucking believable <laughs> Unbelievable. And you know, you gotta love the guy. He fucking lived to be like 80 something years old. He had fucking emphysema. His liver had given out like three times. And, and he wasn't supposed to be drinking at that point, but obviously he was, he was doing it on the slide. My brother went to visit him in the hospital and uh, he had two things in the side table. One was a Red Sox hat, because he was a huge Red Sox fan. And the, the other one, he says to Kiwi, open that, uh, open that drawer. When his wife left the room, just open that drawer. And he opens it, there's a Red Sox hat. He says, move the hat, he moves the hat. It's a pint of fucking Jameson. <laughs> It's like, give me that. No. <laughs> what the fuck? You know? So some stereotypes Uncle Connie. do exist for a reason. I yes, guess, obviously. Suppose. Obviously. Yeah. So did you even when you uh, when you were had then went into making movies and stuff like that? Yeah. And ref and all uh, movies around that time. Were you still writing a lot? Well, I was trying to, obviously, I didn't know how to act for the camera. I never did any acting on camera yeah. at Emerson. The one guy, strangely enough, who did, Stephen Wright made a short film in which he starred that he wrote and directed. And it was, the, I still remember the first time I saw it, I was like, wow, he does nothing. He was, his, uh -huh. he was, his acting was so small, yeah. right? Um, so when I, when I first, as things were happening for me, I realized, fuck, I started to get film offers. I'm like, I don't know how to fucking act in a movie. Yeah. So um, I was fortunate enough early, right, before, right as No Cure for Cancer was breaking in New York, uh, when I was doing it in, uh, in Manhattan, um, uh, somebody who worked for uh, De Niro said, you should go see this show. And so I got a phone call that he'd seen the show, and I went and met him and Jane Rosenthal, his yeah. business partner. Now, you can imagine how big, I mean, the first time for me in, that I saw people that I knew in the movies was Mean Streets. Mm -hmm. That was the first time in my life I was like, oh, I fucking know guys like that. Because, you know, I grew up seeing, you know, John Wayne and Clint Eastwood and people that didn't live near me, you know what I mean? Yeah. Characters. Yeah. Um, so it was a big thing for me to, to meet him. And he gave me a book called I Was Interrupted, um, which was a book about how to act uh, on a movie set. Um, and I, I read that book uh, end to end, and then I started to get film offers, and now as I'm going, you know this part of me, I'm watching people make movies. Ted Demi is my good friend who did No Cure for Cancer, my MTV spots, and, and created your MTV raps, which became the big, the moment black music, hip hop, took off at MTV. Right. So he had a calling card. Then my MTV spots took off with No Cure for Cancer, which Ted was involved with. Um, Doug Herzog, who went to Emerson with me, is the head of MTV. And he says, whatever you guys want to do, you have carte blanche, right? Um, Richie Lagravenis, who was one of the worst actors at Emerson, <laughs> and he will confess to this, sure. um, he had left acting and gone into writing. And at that point in time, when I got famous, Richie had just been nominated for an Oscar for writing The Fisher King Fisher. with Robin Williams. Yeah. So he had the script, The Ref. Ted and I said, we want to make The Ref. They said, um, and I'm not fucking kidding, they said, we'll give you guys like $30 million, $40 million to make it if you put Roseanne Barr and Tom Arnold in the, in the roles. <laughs> yeah, and we were like, fuck you, we're not doing it. <laughs> and 
Uh, and so in the course of making that movie and Richie was on the set and watching Richie let us improvise, we would sh be shooting a scene and then while we were lighting, we would be improvising and playing with the next day's work and Richie would write up the improvs and change it and stuff. Um, and knowing Richie for as long as I did, I realized I need to learn how to write. Uh, and I just started to write shit. John Stewart, who's one of my oldest friends at the time, uh, and I were, you know, we had, we had written a brilliant idea for MTV that they didn't make. Yeah. It was called, um, fuck, I'm gonna forget the title now. It was a, it was a and I'm, I, look at, I'm just telling you the truth. I said, let's do a show with puppets where you talk, because John, people don't realize, John always talked about uh, the news and stuff like that in his stand-up, and he was an angry little fucking Jew. That's what John was. <laughs> he was fucking hilarious. He was really fucking smart, but he was an angry little Jew. Yeah. I said, I got an idea for a show. We go on. I talk about pop culture. You talk about the news, and we have puppets. That was the idea of the show, and it's set in a basement, so we can shoot it really cheap for MTV, and they turned it down, and John started writing these scripts, and he's like, I'm learning how to write scripts, and, you know, and I would read his scripts, and then I started to write scripts and give them to him, and both of us were giving each other notes like, your socks, so does yours. <laughs> so we didn't, know, we didn't go anywhere with them. Right. But yeah. I, I was desperate to find somebody that I could write with who could teach me. That's how, I, when I met you, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what happened. So what happened was, um, you know, I was producing movies and also starring in movies and improvising with like fucking De Niro and Hoffman on a set or, mm -hmm. or you know, working with Clint Eastwood, like with famous fucking people. Um, uh, when they said that Peter Tolan was available, I had already written some pages for an idea for a, a cop show, a single camera cop show. And you, single camera in those days was unheard of. There was, there was no single this camera. This was the beginning. This was the beginning of it. Yeah. And the two shows that came on that were single camera at the same time were us and Arrested Development. And Sports Night. And Sports Night. Sports Night. So uh, I wrote some pages and I said, I can't fucking write this. And that's why I went to find Peter. And I gave Peter the pages like an asshole the first night I met him. I'm like, yeah, this fucking guy won an Emmy with fucking Shandling. And now he's going to read my stupid actor fucking pages. And I um, always I have said many times, unfortunately, that, you know, I, I, you don't want to go to that meeting, you know, where uh, the actor gives you the pages. Because normally, you know, like an actor with pages is like a five-year-old with a Glock. <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> nothing good is going to come from that. And he's right. Yeah, it's he's like right. a mental flesh wound. I mean, it's just like, oh my god. So the but first fucking meeting with this guy, right? I should have just kept the fucking pages, like, a, but like an asshole. I'm like, hey, I wrote some stuff, which I'm sure I could tell by the look on his face, like, oh boy. But he took them. I took them, and I and I had to. Dr I met him in Connecticut, and I drive back into the city, or was being driven, and I said, "Well, I might as well get this over, with." And I started to read them, and I started to go, "Boy, what would I write on the next page?" And a couple of times it was there, and I thought, "That's weird," and we must have some weird cosmic connection, and so we started writing together. And if you notice, on I think I think it's every episode of the job and Rescue Me, we've always share credit. Yes. There's always. never a single credit for one of right. us or the other of us. It's always shared. Because, and, I, and I don't think, and I'll say it here, I'm going to be extremely generous. God knows why. I don't think that you get enough credit. I mean, obviously, people were, were uh, stunned, let's just say, by the acting that went on uh, in those shows. Let's just say that. But I don't think you get enough credit for the writing of it. Because, you know, Rescue Me was 95 or 96 hours of television, effectively written by three people. Now that's, that's yeah. big. But listen, <clears throat> let's, let's give credit where credit is due. I mean, I fucking didn't know what I was doing. Um, you did by then. I did, no, by then. Yeah, I learned yeah, on the yeah, job. Yeah. He, was, he was so gracious to, uh, to include me as a writing partner, and, and, I, and I watched as I went. And, and I had no choice. Whoa. You said, I'm going to be your writing partner or I'm going to hit you. Did I say that? Something like that. Okay, well. You stick that dog on I, me. I did. I had an Irish wolfhound who tried to fucking bite his cock off. <laughs> now, I didn't tell him to do that, but I think it struck the fear of God in him. Yeah, the dog. He was afraid not to work with me. The dog figured out exactly what But I did. I, I learned that Evan Riley, who was our, our third wheel on Rescue Me, he started, he worked at, uh, he was a writer's assistant at The Sopranos, and he crossed over to us. And we learned a fucking shitload. I know also, not just as a writer did I learn from you, but also you were so, he's a fucking great director. So watching him direct made, the, it, made it so much easier to do the show. Um, 
and also the fucking cast. I mean, yeah, our cast great, on Rescue great, Me, great. Was, and then the yeah. jobs. I mean, yeah. Jesus Christ. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the majority, like some of those people on, on both those shows, Bill Nunn. I mean, fucking Bill Nunn. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You know, John Ortiz. Uh, Skirty. But, Skirty. John Skirty. I mean, and Callie Thorne. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Jesus yeah. fucking Christ. Half the time you just go like, guys, here's the pages, yeah. but just do whatever you want. And improvising in the, in the firehouse kitchen scenes on Rescue Me, we would put up like three cameras and we would go, like to his credit, um, uh, Daniel Sanjata, who that's, played Franco, would say, guys, I mean, I, he hated the improv, he couldn't improv. He's like, guys, what are you doing? I just need to know when to say my thing. No, but he would, he would do one thing, yes. unfortunately. And we tried to break him of this, but apparently he was so frozen up yes. at the idea of having improvised. You'd go, you know, so it would be uh, funny, 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 and it'd swing to him, and he'd go, so uh, fucking a chick in the ass, and, uh, and yeah. he'd just go, whoa, yeah, whoa, yeah, yeah. whoa. And nothing to do with the scene. Nothing to do with the scene. Nothing, it's a scene, be, you know, there's a but family I, but there I'm, or I, something. I'm telling you, like, there's, like John Skirty, Pasquale, I, I can't even begin to talk about some, like you give him dumb stuff to say, and then the way that he would say it, or the thing that he would turn it into, thank God we were shooting in, most often with multiple cameras, but also yeah. like, like in the kitchen was great, because if you started to break, you just turn around and face the other way and grab something, <laughs> like, you know, it's a kitchen, so there's plenty of shit, because, but Skirty and, and those guys, they would, they would go into a, to a scene, and they would, and Callie Thorne too, they would start up, and you could see it in their eyes, that we're going off the script, you don't know where it's going, so you're happy as a producer, writer guy, yeah. but as an actor, you're like, I'm fucking right in this scene because I don't know where the fuck I'm going, which showed up on screen, yeah. you know, because we would, we would cross shoot, which I love doing. So both actors, or in the case of the Firehouse Kitchen, multiple actors, are, it's like doing theater. So when an improv, improv happens and you're in it, it, everybody's kind of in the same scene. Yeah. You know, that shit was, God, I love that shit. Yeah. You know, yeah. and the dumb guys were just so, they were so, <laughs> Sometimes they were so dumb, I would have to, to break and walk out of the room because I, <laughs> fucking uh, Sean Garrity, I yeah. mean. And Lombardi, if you put them two, oh the two God. of them together. It was, it was oh my God, board. I just think back like, on just a, some of the simple dumbest shit that they would say, but they would change it up, especially Garrity, yeah. uh, Pasquale. And the way he would look at you, you're just like, fuck, dude, I can't keep looking at this character. I'm going to start <laughs> fucking laughing. You know, Steve has gone on to be like a Broadway star. He's uh, the lead of... Musicals. He's in a play right now. Yeah, he's a brilliant and singer. He's not. Uh, he's for some reason is not really doing that much comedy, which it seems to me such a waste. I know. I know. You know he was so great in that. God, he was great in that fucking show. Now, do, should we talk about the book at all? No. All right. Fuck I think the we should book. Go right Just to the buy it. Fuck the book. Buy. It. You have the book. You're gonna read it. It's gonna hopefully make you laugh your ass off. And we should go to Q. The book is very funny. Question. Yes, I just got the Q. So now we could, we will ask you if you have any questions for Mr. Leary. And, or Peter. Uh, or me. Or, me I, or things that Doesn't I know about Dennis, this gentleman right down here. I, will, I think uh, we have a microphone. I'll bring a microphone to you. We'll oh, you do? To you. They could probably just yell it, it out. Here it comes. Here we go. Well, you want everyone to hear. I'm a uh, huge fan going. Yeah, great. Well, it doesn't even work. Yelling would be better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, huge fan going back to the first time I heard Asshole on the radio. You've given me many laughs through hard times. Thank you. But uh, what's next? Oh. Beyond uh, the book. Beyond the book. <laughs> Um, I don't know yet. I have, a, I have a series that I didn't write with Peter, I wrote with somebody else that, um, that uh, uh, I've sold and we're in the midst of, uh, of uh, rewriting it and getting it prepared. So it's very, it has similarities to Rescue Me only in the sense that it's very, very, very dark and it's got a, it's got a vein of comedy that runs through it, but it's, it's pretty fucking dark. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I really want to do it and that they bought it. So we'll see if it makes it to air. I, I mean, I'm still, it still amazes me. I don't know. I guess I, on Rescue Me with John Landgraf was an amazing experience. He's the head of FX. So he's been always my favorite guy in this business. Um, there's another guy named Bill, Bill McGoldrick who's running USA now, who I did Sirens with over there, who's also a really smart guy. Um, I just, I, as dark as those two guys are, and as much as they, they like my dark stuff, I really, you know, even on Rescue Me, they were always like, God, we have to make them likable, like here, somewhere. <laughs> um, so it's very dark. We'll see if we, if we make it to air. Yeah. Very funny. Anyone else? I That's dare it. You. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. One question about, yes. 
Yes, just yell, because that's yeah, oh, just, it's going to take him an hour Hi. to get you. Um, so oh, wait, uh, wait, wait. I have a friend in film school, and he did a little skit once. So he was just filming me and my friend all like high and drunk and just talking about bullshit and stuff. And um, he, he presented it to the class, and, he, and they were like, wow, you know, like, where'd you find these actors? He's like, no, these are my friends. They're, they're always fucking high. So it was, it was, it was a fun experience. And like, uh, I don't know, I'm surprised how much fun we had. And uh, I was just wondering, do you have any advice for us as like just making stuff for fun and just like have, just really enjoying it? I think your uncle's, I think your uncle has come back to life. I wasn't sure I like, quite heard the beginning of that, of that question. Are you talking about having fun or? Well, yeah, my friend's in film school and he's like, he's, he's gotten a lot of experience. He's been doing really well. And I was thought like, man, if, if he ever needs help with like, you know, casting and finding some funny, goofy people, I'm like, man, I could totally jump into that. And I was just like, I don't know. I just, I was just more advice for him, I guess. Sorry. Well, I'm not sure. What's the question? There's no question <laughs> per se. There is no oh. question per se. It's How old about, are you? Uh, 25. How much? 25. 25, did you yeah. say? Yeah. So is your question like, should I jump in and fucking try to be an actor? Is that what your question is? Or uh, a filmmaker? Just, just advice from like my, for my friend as like a filmmaker. Just so like, your friend is using a bunch of friends to, to actually <laughs> produce stuff, right? Yeah. Well, that's what he should be doing. Yeah. And, <laughs> no, it is. Yes, yes. Yeah. Everybody says to me, what should I do? I say, you know what? Get some friends together. Get, hopefully they're talented. Shoot the thing. Put it on the internet. There's this thing called the internet, which apparently... <laughs> you young people know about and uh and and have it be seen so he's he's doing the right thing just tell him that and we're not going to help him <laughs> <laughs> sorry i mean we're not we're really out of the business technically so i moved to boston in 79 did you ever go down to where Can are you i can't see who, these yeah who people. is this person right here where are you did you ever go down to cantones to see bands uh, Cantone's was owned by Mario Cantone's yes. parents. Which, by the way, I mean, just to, just to think back on this, and they were great. They, we, um, yeah, we went down there all the time. As a matter of fact, one of my friends uh, and Mario's friends were, were the people that convinced his parents, because it was in the financial district in Boston. So his parents made money selling lunch to you know, financial people, and at night had nothing. So we said, open it up as a punk rock place. We know all these punk rock bands will book the place for you. So we got to drink for free. <laughs> Mario's brothers, they were all, this Italian family, as a, if you've ever seen Mario's one-man show, as he talks about, after his parents died, he talked about how his parents were both bookies, uh, which was the secret that Mario could never see. But we, like, we were like, this is weird. Your parents sell like eight sandwiches during the day. <laughs> <laughs> we bring in these fucking punk rock bands. Nobody's paying the cover. It's all fucking guest shots. And meanwhile, they're counting money in the back room. What the fuck's going on? <laughs> and meanwhile, Mario's brothers were all guys who talk like this with these noses. Mario's so creative. Yeah, he's really fucking creative. Yeah, the girls love him. Yeah, the girls fucking love him. <laughs> It was, a, it was a fucking blast, dude. I never paid for a drink or a sandwich in that place. Wow. Yeah, it was great. So you have an intimate knowledge of that. That's great. Yeah, it was awesome. Hi. <laughs> um, I have a question. I'm a huge fan of Rescue Me. Where are you? These I'm are almost right like, here. Oh, okay. almost like ghosts Hi. of people. I know. It's like after these front rows. It goes everybody in the ghost. front row is like, no, we can't say anything but the ghost. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I actually, okay, I'll stand up. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Um, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering... Um, how many, like, for, for your character, Tommy Gavin, which is amazing, um, for, for doing your character, how many life experiences, like, from your own life, how much did you take that into Tommy Gavin, especially with your, like, ghost experiences and all of that? Well, um, <laughs> unfortunately, for better or worse, because, uh, uh, I don't know any other way to work, and I'm not against, I lo I'm totally, uh, like any way people want to work on a set is fine with me. For me, I do have to do sort of the method thing in terms of uh, emotional stuff, like dramatic stuff. Um, so, having been through the experience, my cousin Jerry Lucy was a firefighter in Worcester, Mass, and he died uh, in December of 99, and then a couple of my friends were killed um, uh, on 9-11, and the firehouse that, we used to kind of base, and, and the place that I took Peter to was a, we based some of these characters sort of on these guys a little bit, we smudged it. But the fires I was most often at was, was one of my buddies had become a firefighter when we were in our 20s, and uh, it, was, it was up on, uh, um, uptown in, in Manhattan. And so all those guys survived that day. 
Um, their rig didn't. Um, so that, that I, had, I went through the, I, because I knew them and I knew so many of the other guys, uh, it was a traumatic experience, obviously, and it was also something you just, I had already kind of been through in miniature with my cousin. My cousin died with five other firefighters a couple years before. So um, I would, it was very easy for me to access. It was not hard at all. Plus, a lot of those guys were our technical advisors on the show, um, so they were around us. Um, so it was a really, it, it was kind of a gift, not just for us as writers, but as an actor. I mean, for me, I, I had the emotions. I had been through it a couple of times. Um, uh, and that was what was so crazy about that show, you know, because we would do such hardcore fucking drama, and then, you know, the next scene would be, you know, laugh your ass off. Yeah. It was, it was uh, I mean, it was what the show, I guess, what people liked about it, why, why we made it. It was based on what really happens in a firehouse, which is one minute you're crushed emotionally, and the other one you're busting the other guy's balls. Um, I think a lot of people didn't like the show for that reason, that it was so funny and so dramatic. They were like, well, what is it? Yeah. It needs to be one thing. We figured out early on there was a show, I don't know, maybe the second or third episode, we had a, a, a real firefighter who was an actor on the show, Ed Sullivan, and Ed's character died in the episode. And also in that episode, the guys had a penis measuring contest. <laughs> so we figured that's the balance. If you're now, do, measure... you, do you remember how we got that fucking penis measuring contest? Do no. You, okay. No. We got it because there was a bunch of tech advisors, Terry Quinn and a couple other guys, uh, Eddie Meehan, whose shirt I'm wearing tonight. Um, uh, the, uh, and then there was a bunch of firefighters who just worked on the show as extras, you know? So they would go to work, and they would come in the next, I mean, like, fucking, these guys, we're pretending to fucking put out fake fires, and these guys would literally come in, like, yeah, I got my neck burned last night at this job. Anyways, what are we doing today? You know, like, real fucking guys. Yeah. And we were having breakfast, so we were, I forget where we were shooting, but we went out to, like, a picnic table where the catering was in the morning. And there were two guys saying, yeah, he fucking cheated, too. He fucking measured from the taint. And I was like, what? <laughs> Because, you know, if we heard good stories, we would take them. He's like, yeah, we were having a fucking cock measuring contest, and this fucking asshole is measuring from his taint. And I was like, ching <laughs> Okay. I'm sure that ended up in the episode. But it that did. Was, that was it the did. balance. Somebody dies, you measure a cock. That was yeah. really it. It was that very delicate thing, you know? Question back here in the back. Hey, what's going on? Uh, so Can't how long... see you. Where are you? But it's All okay. Back, oh, hey. Standing up. Uh, so how long did it take you to write the book? And what was like the hardest part about writing it? Uh, it's, it's galling how fast it, my wife is a novelist. She writes real books. The book that she's currently working on involved research that's set in the 1920s, vast historical research, which she physically went and did in person in Pennsylvania. She's been working on it for a year and a half. She actually went back to the 20s. Yes, yeah, she went back to the 20s, right? She constructed a time right. machine, went, you know, that, a lot of work. So she's been working on it for a year and a half. I, right after the election, I, I, had, I, I do these two ch uh, stand-up concerts every year, once for the Cam Neely Foundation up in Boston and once for the Michael J. Fox uh, uh, Parkinson's Foundation in New York. So, and I, the only old thing I'll do is the asshole song. I always do new material. So right at four days after the election last year, I do a fucking show for 15,000 people, and I, I fucking railed against Hillary and against Trump, and, and I realized the audience was explosive, and I realized, oh my God, it's not just me that thinks this whole fucking thing was ridiculous, and I decide to write a book. And I had six weeks off, and I sat down, uh, you know, I'm, it's, it's not like it's a real book, it's a, just a, it's a rant, you know? <laughs> So I, you know, like, fuck, and I start writing the fucking thing, and like six weeks later, I go to my wife, hey, you want to read my first draft? And she's like, I fucking hate you! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I know, I know. So it, it didn't, I mean, the stuff was in there. I touched on it in those two concerts, so I had it. I came up with the fake tweets idea, um, and that was just the fucking, that's the gift that that's keeps on giving. Funny. Yeah, that might be... Funny. I, I might do a whole book of fake tweets after this book because yeah. that was so much fucking fun. Yeah. Um, so not very long. Um, it's, you know, once you... For a comedian, I think, if you decide to write in it, it for me, it's always anger and rage. And a, uh, that but it, it's also... It is a fairly substantial book. It's not... 
I, I, you know, oh, I a, told Stuart. It's I thought, a, I, when, I, when I fucking was getting close to the end, I realized I'm going to be over 300 pages. He used to make fun of my fucking books for being coasters. So I fucking texted him, hey, asshole, 306 pages, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Write a book, asshole. And, and, that, and he's got to do 307 pages to beat me. All right. So there was yeah. that, the so obviously. The is... <laughs> Anger, rage, and competition is why I wrote the book. Because <laughs> Stuart, Stuart should write a book now. He probably will, because I, I wrote one. Exactly, yeah. yeah. It's a challenge. I did it to piss off John Stewart. <laughs> Anyone else? We'll do two more questions. Two yes. more questions. There's a man in the middle that we can see that has no mic. Yeah, this guy, we can see him, and we can, his mouth will move and we'll be able to tell. Hi, um, I'm just curious. It's not you. <laughs> what the hell? All right, he gets say, the last question. I was going to say, that's talent. You're, you're the last Wait, question. Where's the person with the mic? I don't even need the mic. I know, but just I know, wait. But you're going to get the you're last You're going to be one. next. I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts on the power of comedy? And do you think that it should be limitless in terms of you can talk about anything as long as it's smart? Or do you think that there should be some limitations? like? Rape uh, jokes or race jokes or those kinds okay, of things. Okay, so I just, this is just by happenstance that this uh, comes up, and I think it's delicious. Um, I think guys, I just was in Boston doing a, a book event, uh, and uh, uh, the theater I was doing my event in is next door to Chris Rock's doing the tail end of his um, uh, tour, right? And Bill Sheft was with me as the moderator. You don't know who he is, but he's a guy from Boston. He's a brilliant writer. Worked for Letterman for all those years. He was winning all those Emmys as, as Dave's right-hand man as a writer on that show. Uh, and he's, he goes all the way back to when me and Chris and everybody started doing stand-up. So we fucking met up just to say hi and everything. And Chris is doing that tour. He's talking about his divorce, which is astonishing because he never talks about personal shit. But we were talking about this thing of uh, guys like us can still go up on stage and you can, you know, in front of... Uh, 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 an audience, a paying audience, basically say anything and get away with it because you're already supposed to be the edgy, crazy fucking guy. And, uh, and I hear so often from young comedians that they, they feel like if they do say something that crosses the line and pushes the envelope while they're working on their act, that they, people fucking go online or Twitter or whatever and they get chastised immediately. Chris, I think, actually got hit because he went into... Um, uh, uh, the comedy cellar in New York in the midst of the tour just to fuck around and push the envelope on some new stuff and some shit went on Twitter uh, about you know, him being a fucking, um, uh, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Jesus Christ, it's great that I can't think of the word. You know, hating women. A misogynist. A misogynist. Wow, that's I, how far we've gone with the Me Too movement. That word has left my fucking head. Um, and that, to me, is is bad for comedy. I think you have, you have to let everybody push the envelope, even if you don't like what they're saying. It's the same thing I say about these right-wing assholes that the kids don't want speaking to colleges. I talk about it in the book. Let them talk. They usually make such fucking fools of themselves that they fucking collapse around themselves anyway. So um, I think there's real power in it. I think uh, comedy is fucking great. I think it is a war. Uh, you know, again, people like, listen, I'm anti all politicians. So I'm just telling you, comedy has always been, and I go back to George Carlin, is the, is the fuck you to power, right? And, uh, and so many great uh, female comics and female showrunners and female stars are now getting their opportunity. And I had this, I yelled at a guy last night in San Diego who got up and said, like, I've kind of given up. I think Trump's just going to fucking get reelected. And I'm like, dude, fuck you. Ba this whole Me Too movement comes out of what happened during the fucking election. And it's like the, it's the actual cause and effect. So fuck you for giving up. There's no giving up. And comedy, uh, to me, is the, is the fuck you to all power. So I just think I'm, I'm really f excited right now about what's going to happen. Listen, I, I don't know Al Franken, OK? Uh, but he needs to go down, and, and tomorrow, yeah. hopefully, with this uh, announcement he has to make. But yeah. um, I think it's fucking great. I think it's really great. I think it's great for female stand-ups. I think it's great for the female voice in television. There's so many fucking great shows right now that are run by women, that are starring women. I think it's fucking great. Well, I Very think excited. That, you know, uh, <clears throat> Jill Soloway, when she was accepting some award recently, said something about deaths of the patriarchy. And I thought, well, she's a, you know, that's kind of like taking it out there. But boy, is she right. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the reaction to Trump and all that sort of stuff where people yes. are going, this is such a regressive thing that's happening in this country yeah. that there has to be a response. And now we're starting to see the response, and it's great. Yeah, and I actually believe, and listen, I'm not being pretentious here. I'm just saying, like, uh, uh, 
they, they always try to do that thing about, you know, they try to bundle all of us show business people into the same, you know, uh, uh, boat, you know, that we're all elite and we're this and we're that. And you know what, go, go fuck yourself, you know? And that's, that's our, this is our stage, this is our microphone, this is however, the music, whatever that we express ourselves, go fuck yourself. I think it's, I think the, it's fantastic and it's not going away. So yeah. we need to get a woman to run against Trump. That's the one, I, I'm not a genius, but I am a doctor. I just think <laughs> we need to get a woman, because, a woman whose husband doesn't have sexual baggage of his own and who doesn't have email problems and, and of her luck, own. And good and, luck right there. Right, I mean, right, but, be a but because a woman will be able, a smart woman uh, will be able to beat this fucking guy and beat him silly in the next election and, and make him the, out to be the oaf and the fool and the Republican Party and make him out as they are. Yeah. Because this fucking Roy Moore shit and all this fucking stuff, that's why I think Al Franken has to go tomorrow because the Democrat, all those, uh, those uh, women who came out today and said that they want him to leave now, it's the Democratic Party saying, we're keeping the bar up here. Fuck Roy Moore and fuck what's happening down there. Fuck Steve Bannon. As, it, it there's has, a great line about Steve Bannon yeah. that Stephen Colbert had. He's the best looking guy in the liquor store. That really <laughs> sums that guy up. That sums that guy up. <laughs> oh my God. All right, sir. Our last question. That final question. No, Better be a good one. No pressure. No pressure. Um, first off, I was an EMT of 10 years and we're a huge fan of Rescue Me and the Dennis Lear Firefighter Foundation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you kind of dipped into it a minute ago about the dark humor of the firehouse situation where you have death in a cock measuring contest. Was there one main pissing match with the network or producers that you guys just wanted to slide into an episode that you could just not get it in there? No. <laughs> Good night, everybody. No, I, it was, uh, no. Uh, we had tremendous support from John Landgraf and FX, and I don't think they ever said, you know, there was one thing that we couldn't do, because you mentioned there was the cunt thing. Mm -hmm. there, there was at the time, and I'm, this is an unfortunate thing, but it just shows sometimes that a personal experience can affect how you see the world. And I know that at times we would, look, at these characters in some cases are not educated people and we're trying to do a truthful show. We're trying to show them the way they really are. And I know Tommy Gavin every now and then say, this person is a retard. Yeah. And these guys, I'm um, surrounded by retards. Yeah. Retards. Well, the Fox, a, a woman high up at Fox, I'm not sure she was the standards and practices person, but somebody high, had, a, had a learning disabled child. And it was a no-go. Like if we went anywhere near that word or anything like that, that got shut down. That was later. Time. That was later. It was like, uh, I want to say like the fourth or fifth season. Yeah. And at that point, we were doing so much stuff. We were like, yeah, that's, that's fine. I mean, that's, that, was, that was John Langraff's only personal thing that he ever brought to us but the on show, that. But the show was, 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 <clears throat> was not always politically correct. Not at all. Uh, not, I mean, not at all. He and says, I'm surrounded by retards in the pilot. In the pilot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because a firehouse is not politically correct. And certainly in, in those days it was, you know, one of the big complaints after, you know, one of the lines, one of the greatest lines that was written. And I think, I'm trying to remember, you wrote the line, but I think we based it on the complaints that people didn't understand that, you know, because they're firefighters, there were funny things that were happening in firehouses during that first week after 9-11 because guys were rotating down on the pile and then coming back to the firehouse. And so people, the general public wouldn't find it funny, but if you were in a firehouse with a bunch of firefighters, it would be funny. And one of the first funny ones that I saw was after like the fourth night, because there was a lot of great food down there. You know, like uh, restaurants were delivering food to the firefighters, gourmet food from restaurants and stuff. And we were in the firehouse, me and Terry Quinn and a bunch of his guys were about to go down to the pile for their shift. And there'd been very good food every night. And this other guy that they worked with came in. He'd just come from the pile from downtown. And he was taking off his bunker gear. And Terry goes, how is it down here tonight? He goes, eh, it's the same. But the food fucking sucked tonight. No fucking. <laughs> <laughs> and we started laughing. He was like, no, I'm serious. It really sucks. Now, <laughs> That's it right there. From, so, so I try to remember the time frame. But there's a line in the pilot where Franco's talking to Tommy Gavin. And he says, oh, man, yeah. we're talking yeah. about people forgetting about 9-11. And there's that great line that Franco says, all that pussy we got after 9-11, now nothing. People forget. Yeah. Yeah. And He's that a, came from real firefighters offended, I knew yeah. that were getting laid yeah. right after 9-11 just for being a firefighter. And that, amongst firefighters, they were like, even the fat, ugly guys are getting laid. 
right? And the outside world didn't understand it, but by the time we made the pilot, um, we put that in. You wrote that, which was... Uh, yeah, but I think we, we had heard the We had sentiment. heard the story, yeah. I, I'm going to say, uh, just because it came to me, um, one of my favorite jokes in Rescue Me, and it's, I hate to say this, I wrote it, but it's a hard joke. And by, by that I mean is it's a joke. Like there's no, it's not conversation that people would have. And it was Skirty that delivered it, John Skirty who played Lou. And they're talking about Franco is going to do the firefighter's calendar, where it's like a beefcake calendar. And, and he's not sure he's going to do it. And you guys are coming out of a fire. And he says to you, he says, you know, he's got to do that thing. Because you're in that calendar. It's, it's, a, it's a license to mint pussy, which incidentally is a failed Ben and Jerry's flavor. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking remember that. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody talks like that. Oh like nobody's, my God. nobody's that clever uh, in real oh life. Oh my so God. It's, it's sort of bad writing, but I couldn't resist. Yeah, it's you know? a, a delivered by John Skirty can deliver any line and turn it into fucking gold. That is true. Mint pussy. Now, how many people would like that fucking ice cream? So, as you know, as you know, if you if you buy the book, which of course you will, Mr. Uh, Doctor Leary. Uh, is a doctor. He's got an honorary doctorate from Emerson. And about a year later, and of course, and he she drops the fucking book exactly. on the floor. She's like, oh my God, she Ooh, can't, he's a real doctor? She can't believe it. And he lorded that over us for about a year. And then I got an honorary doctorate from UMass. And uh, so it was actually the, the greatest set in television because you could actually see one doctor and get a second opinion the same day. <laughs> it was. Fantastic. Ruined my doctor. Ruined it. Do you have anything else you'd like to say before we leave? I would like to thank you all for coming, and this was a fucking blast, and I hope you enjoyed the book. Thanks, everybody.